sell the, the Amir, there's no Amir, right? So it just doesn't, that just doesn't, the function just doesn't happen. When the, uh, but the Shehu says it's obligatory by consensus, according to the Shehu Uthman Danfodio. It's obligatory by consensus. You can find the statement in Kitab Masail al Muhimma, in Bayan Wujuba Hijra, and other books. It's obligatory by consensus to appoint an Amir if there isn't one. And the people of influence should come together and appoint an Amir. So if you don't have one, that's not an excuse. And if you, you say, well, we don't have the means to implement the different things, to implement justice, to implement, you know, whatever applies, then you implement what you can. And also, it's not an excuse. It becomes obligatory on us then to build the institutions so that we can do that. That's like a man, you know, who you say, well, uh, you know, uh, I don't have a job. I don't have the means to provide for my family. I have a means to be an Amir as I'm supposed to, right? So I'm just going to kick back and I'm going to raise the kids and just she can work. No, you go out and try to find a job, man. You go out and try to find a job and you strive and you struggle. You don't have to have it right away, but you have to strive and struggle and have a niya and an intention. And it's in the hands of Allah whether you succeed. We have to have an intention that we're trying to establish Islam to the fullest. That we're trying to meet these, uh, these requirements and so on. And in today's environment, you know, if you're not under the, the authority, you're always under the authority of somebody. If you're not under the authority of your own Amirs and you're not choosing your own leaders, someone else is choosing your leaders for you. Like Amir Mustafa said, it, it, it's an illusion thing you just don't have a leader. All right? The government is taking taxes out of your paycheck every day. You have to, when you have an issue, when the, the second part of the eye is about this. Who do you go to when you disagree over something? That shows who your real leader is. Because you have a problem between Muslims and you run to somebody else who's not a Muslim to protect you, that shows who your awliya, who your protectors are. You can say you don't have bayah to them. You can say, I don't have bayah, I don't have a jamaat. There is no amir. But really, that's your amir. And, uh, you know, and it says in the Quran, I mean, there's so many places where it says not to take the disbelievers as awliya. There's numerous places. I have a, a list of uh, about eight, but I didn't want to burden you guys with, with, uh, with you know, with all of them right now. Um, and so, you know, it says in Surah Al-Anfal, it says, Verily, the disbelievers are awliya, the protectors and, and, uh, and uh, maintainers of each other. And if you, the believers, do not do likewise, then well, there will be great injustice and corruption on the earth. Do you see corruption on the earth? <laughs> The people who are supposed to be the awliya of this country kill a black person every 21 hours. That's not counting overseas. I'm talking about right here in this country. A black person is shot dead by the police or armed security forces, according to a study that was done by the Malcolm X Grassroots Organization several years ago. Uh, this was this is in the 2010s. I can't remember exactly. I remember when it came out and I read it. Every 21 point something hours. 21.4, 21.3, something like that. Exactly. In this country. And you can shout and be mad all day long about what they're doing, but what are we doing to create an alternative to that? George Floyd was killed because somebody called the cops on him over a counterfeit, I believe it was a $20 bill. He probably didn't even know it was counterfeit. And the worker was just like, okay, I'm just gonna tell the boss. And the boss called the police. And that whole situation, completely unnecessary, escalated to the point of a man having a, 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 a devil kneel on his neck for eight minutes until he died. Are those the kind of awliya we want? And you could be mad at seeing that. And we could be, be, you know, say, oh, we don't like that or whatever, but what are we doing to create an alternative? Who do we call when we have an issue? And you say, oh, we don't have the capacity. Well, again, like a man that don't have no money, but you got a family, we have families, man. We have women and children. We have a community, all right? And those of us who are African people, we have a Muslim community and we even have our non-Muslim community, right? Who are our, our kinfolk. We need to, to establish, if we don't have the capacity, establish the capacity. So appoint your own leaders and follow the sunnah. And don't let somebody outside decide that for you. The moment that you allow somebody else to appoint your amirs for you, the moment you just allow it to become this kind of uh, internet popularity contest where it's just kind of vague celebrity leaders who are seen as leadership, but then there's no accountability because they don't actually set the real position, then you, you know, you've given up sovereignty to whoever is, is deciding that. 
and we're not going to give up sovereignty to anybody. So where we're at as a Jamaat right now is that we need to build institutions to do exactly that. And some of those institutions already exist. You know, we have the institute that uh, Sidi Wadiri Oscar and Brother Dujan and some of the others are running for the Brothers in Prison. And we have 200 people already signed up to take classes with that. We have the Fudiao Institute of Linguistic Sciences. Even more, usually we have the Rabat, right, that we established in Atlanta with a group home in Islamic learning for young Muslim men who are going to be our leaders in the next, uh, in the next, uh, in the next generation, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah increase them and give them tawfiq and guide them. And we have this Masala in Vallejo under the leadership of Amir Hamza, which we're trying to use as a jump off point to do bigger things to where we can have our own and do for self so that we're not looking to others to constantly do for us. Um, so institutions have to be built. Because otherwise all this is just talk. You can talk about what you don't like, but it's another thing to build what you actually want. And we can do that with Tawfiq from Allah. We'll continue about that in a moment. But I'm gonna uh, end on the note that if we look at these institutions as forms, then what is the content behind those? There's an inward and an outward. There's a, a physical and a spiritual aspect of everything, right? And we say, well, you wanna get money or get power, or get institutions. Well, what's the spiritual reality behind that? We'll discuss that in a moment, inshallah. أقول كولي هذا واستغفر الله الذي واستغفر الله لي ولكم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله continue so uh, the, one of the first things when Amir Mustafa our national Amir was made Amir one of the first things if not the first thing that I ever heard from him was his email that he sent out to everybody after he was appointed and it focused I don't want to say almost entirely but the most striking thing that was the, very centrally focused on repairing relationships and on brotherhood and he said that was the first order of business for a community that had gone through some, you know, we had gone through some stagnation, some crisis. And he said the first order of business is Toba and then repairing relationships. And he said, I quote, the health of a Jamaat is determined by the strength of its relationships. Forgiving, asking for forgiveness, repairing broken and damaged relationships through acts of kindness is from the exalted Sunnah of the best of creation. Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Can everyone hear me in the back? The holding of grudges, animosity, and hatred is from Iblis. Allah's curse be upon him. The qalb, the heart of a human being, is not designed to hold such things. Ya Jamaat, befriending the believer is wajib, obligatory, based on the book, the sunnah, and consensus of the scholars. To befriend them does not mean just, just mere contact. It does not mean just mere contact, but sincere affection. And that meant a lot to me at that time. And he said that that was the thing to start out with trying to rebuild this Jamaat with. Toba and repairing relationships and establishing strong relationships. We mentioned last time, Imam Ali radiallahu anhu was asked, you know, why is your, and we said this before, and I'm going to keep saying it and say it again. So whoever heard it before, that's fine. You can keep hearing it. Ali Radiallahu was asked, why is it that your reign is so full of fitna and so full of bloodshed and problems? It's always a problem. And, you know, in Omar and Ali, Omar and Abu Bakr Radiallahu Anhu, there was, there was not problems like this under them. Why is that? And Ali Radiallahu Anhu responded and said, because in the reigns of Umar and Abu Bakr, they had followers like me, and I have followers like you. <laughs> and one of our, our teachers, our uncle, uh, Amir Hassan, he mentioned, he said, in his opinion, a community, it can survive 
iffy leadership. It can survive bad leadership. A couple bad leaders won't necessarily, they can destroy a Jamaat, don't get me wrong, but won't, it could survive. But it will not survive if the rank and file is corrupt. You could have an excellent leader, and if all his followers don't support him, and all his followers are corrupt, and the generality of the Jamaat is engulfed in sin and engulfed in disobedience and engulfed in fitna and fighting among themselves, then it's not going to go nowhere. And you can see this pattern in the Quran as well. If you look at Surah Al Anfal, you look at other surahs, right? That everything is going to is going to collapse after the fitna enters between the hearts and the ranks of the believers, right? When we start fighting among ourselves and having issues with each other among the common people, a lot of other fitna just kind of snowballs and avalanches off of that. So I would say that if these institutions that we're trying to build are the forms, if they're the outward forms that we're trying to build to establish Islam, then the brotherhood and the love, peace of Allah, between all of you is the content. Because you can have all of those things. So we can have millions of dollars, huge masjids, and some people already have those things. And, ha and they do have the content. I'm not saying everybody that has those things doesn't have the content, there's no spirituality. But some people have those things and it's devoid of spirituality. It's devoid of benefit. It's actually probably more of a fitna for them that they have those things. And I swear by Allah, I would take Juma in this park and I would take our lint pocket having, you know, struggling uh, Jamaat with our situation with no buildings and no institutions over that any day. I'm not saying don't have it, because remember the whole first part was about let's establish institutions. But my point is, we don't want to get there and lose the soul. The soul and the content of this is, uh, you know, what it says in Surah al file when Allah said, paraphrasing, Basically, you were on the you were were enemies of each other, and you were on the edge of the pit of hell, and yet Allah brought you together and made you brothers. And then He says to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, again paraphrasing, that you Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if you had spent all the wealth in the world, all the resources and institutions in the world, you could not have brought their hearts together. But Allah brought their hearts together, and that's the content of what we're trying to get. And it's not meaningful. We don't want to get there and look back and be like, we done lost where we started. So, you know, let's make sure that that's strong from the beginning. And so those relationships, as I mean, Mustafa said, they have to be strong. They have to focus on building those relationships and maintaining those relationships. One of the most important is that between the old and the young. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, again, closely paraphrasing, the one uh, who does not have reverence for our elders and mercy for our young people is not from us. And separate khutbahs need to be given, a whole khutbah dedicated to each one. And then numerous other khutbahs in classes, right? And disrespect for the parents is put right after shirk in the Quran. And we mentioned this before in the last talk, so I won't dwell on it. You know, but if you destroy and sever relationships with the elders, then there won't be the barakah and everything that's been built for hundreds of years, both the outward and the inward all the wisdom and experience, all of the barakah and the blessings, even if, if there was corruption and there was problems, you be cut off from that and you're starting from scratch. And why start from scratch when we have 1400 years and we have an unbroken sanad, an unbroken chain of elders and teachers connecting us through Amir Mustafa, Sheikh Muhammad, Sheikh uh, Muhammad Al-Amin Ibn Adam Karyanga, Sheikh Adam, uh, Sheikh, uh, Adam Karyanga, all the way back to Sultan Muhammad Bello, the, uh, the Sheikh Uthman Nafolio, Sheikh Abdullahi, all the way back to Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jalani, all the way back to Imam Ali, radiallahu anhu, all the way back to the best of creation, the only one who matters, the actual one and only personality that this deen revolves around and is based upon, the person of Sayyidina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you break off those relationships with our elders, no matter, uh, and all of us have elders, not just the elders here, the elders of the elders sitting here, the elders who have passed away, who are in the graves even, right? If you break away and violate those relationships, then you're gonna be building, it's like, uh, it says in uh, the commentary, Asnid al-Fakir, that the person who doesn't have a, a sanad is like someone who's like an orphan. He's like a foundling in the path. <laughs> who doesn't, uh, and, so, and so, you know, we have to stick to that. And the same thing goes the other way with the youngsters. Everybody likes to emphasize what advantages they have. You know, I become a father, so now I'm talking about elders, right? 
when you're a teenager, it was all about have mercy, right? And but the same thing, we have to have mercy with the young people. We always hard on young people and driving them away. That's, uh, you know, just as destructive. How are you going to have a future? And you, you can only be so hard on our children and on our young people when they're the product of us. And also between, uh, between women and men. And this is essential. And this is me, you know, uh, speaking from my opinion, the opinion of my, my parents. And it's just something I believe strongly. And I don't have as much of a deal for it, so I'll keep it short. But when the relations between men and women break down, what do you have? You're not gonna get anywhere having a war between genders, man, on either side. And I would counsel everybody, don't get pulled into that on either side. And as men in particular, this is weightier and heavier on us. Because if you're an Amir, you look at Usul al Siyasa by Sultan Muhammad Bello, where he talks about this concept, it's weightier on you to shoulder responsibility for any problem in any situation. If there's issues between men and women, men are the ones who are supposed to shoulder that burden heavier. One of our teachers mentioned that, uh, uh, I think it was my uncle Hassan, Amir Hassan again, who mentioned, one of his teachers mentioned. He said that in his teacher's opinion, the, when it talks about the degree that men have over women in the Quran, he said that that degree is that when a man takes away the rights of a woman, then she cancels his rights, basically. So like, you know, rights go both ways. She says, all right, you're not taking care of me. You're violating my rights. I'm not giving you your rights. Mm. And that's the way of it. But when a woman violates on the rights of a man, he turns the other cheek and he just goes ahead and he still does what he's supposed to do regardless. He shoulders more of the burden. And this is a special rank that he has as a man. And this is a special rank that the Amir has too. The Amir shoulders the burdens for other people. He's not always pointing at somebody else saying, man, they did it, it's on them. Well, the event was off time and it's because everybody else, everybody else. And men shouldn't be like that. So we need to rectify our relationships between men and women. Uh, and then also between peers. Time check real quick. Imam al-Ghazali says that the duties of brotherhood, and this applies between women as well, between peers, between us as brothers, there are about eight of them. And the Shay who mentioned, and I'm gonna use this as about my last set of points, because I really want us to remember this. This is the point about men and women. The Shaykh, uh, Shaykh Muhammad, Uthman al-Fodio was his opinion, and he mentions this in Usul al-Tariq and other texts, that in the absence of the teaching Shaykh in the path, in the Tariqah, when he's not present with you, he said the brotherhood of the Jamaat, of the other students, collectively becomes like the Shaykh. And that's precious knowledge and a precious thing to think about for those of us, right, who our Shaykh is absent. Our Shaykh Muhammad Sharif is in Mali, he can't come back. And, uh, you know, and, and I won't go into that, but for various people who in the West, we have the situation. Look at not any one individual, but all together, right? The virtues and the barakah of all of the brothers and the sisters collectively is like a teaching shaykh. That and your personal relationship with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and sending salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And they, at least they say a minimum of 5,000 salawat a day to try to uh, reach that relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, a minimum. Um, you know, so it's at least start with, with uh, getting our brotherhood off point. We're not up to the 5,000 yet. Um, and so Imam Ghazali mentions eight points. Eight duties that you have to your brother or your sister. The first is material support. And this is all from Ihya Alum al in the chapter on uh, the duties of brotherhood. Material support, which is basically helping your sister or brother out materially. Uh, and this is without letting it get to a point where she's forced to ask. When I read that, I realized the depths of ignorance that me and so many other people are steeped in because I really believe that. I thought that if a brother don't don't say he needs any type of help, right, and you didn't know about his situation, then that kind of frees you from obligation. On the contrary, Imam Ghazali says that's how you know that you failed in your obligation, that he had to come to you and ask. Hmm. You already failed that he's coming to you asking. So how are we gonna know? We have to be physically gathering together. You have to be checking up on brothers, right? You have to go to him and don't make him ask, man. Don't make people ask. 
always be out there. Again, like we were saying about that principle and with the women and children the same way. Don't wait until your wife comes to you asking you, you know, saying that, that she feels, you know, uh, you know, like, like your, your relationship is emotionally empty or until she acts out and, you know, shows you the way that women do, will show you what their problems are through some indirect means that you might not understand as a man. Don't wait till it gets to that point. Don't point the finger at her. Ask yourself, I'm not me in this household, right? Let me deal with issues before they arrive. Let me go extra. Let me, let me be the one going to you. You know what I mean? Let me be the one heading issues off. Let me go to brothers and find out what's going on with them. Let me go to brothers and be in their house in the first place so that I'll see when something's wrong and I can help. The second point is a uh, personal support, which is basically supporting him and helping him out in general, again, without him having to ask. And this extends to our families and loved ones and to those who have passed away. Visit the graves of those who have passed away and our teachers who have passed away. Visit the grave of uh, our brother Imran Ibn Ismail, Rahimahullah, who recently passed away. Visit the graves of Auntie Najia, you know, who passed away, and the others who may have forgotten to mention. Big, uh, big Uncle Shaheed, Rahimahullah. Uh, and look after the loved ones of your loved ones, you know what I mean? Even if I don't have any relationship with somebody, if somebody I love loves them, then look after them, you know what I mean? Let that mean something to you. Don't be like, oh, that's your homie, that's your partner. That's your cousin, I don't care. You know what I mean? He's not, he not Muslim, he's not on me. It's like, if he's, if he's your people, if your brother loves him, then that should mean something. You know what I mean? Let that mean something. Uh, silence, not saying anything harmful to him or about him, with straining the tongue. Speaking out, the fourth one, speaking out. That's giving it sincere advice, sincere nasiha, and being warm. One of the signs of nasiha, the scholars say, when it's given properly, is that it has a good effect. If you give nasiha and there's a big old blow up and the brother like freaks out and never come back to the masjid and loses his mind, it's true. You could be like, oh, well, he just, that's just him. He has bad character and can't take advice. He's thin skinned. That might be true. But if you knew that, then there was no virtue in him giving the, you know, the, the, him the nasiha. The sign the nasiha was given properly is it's done with intelligence, with emotional intelligence in the way that the Prophet ﷺ gave people advice, right? That when he sent a messenger, he sent someone who spoke the person's language. When he appointed Amirs and sent emissary, he would often send people who were from that person's tribe, right? With intelligence. When he spoke to somebody, he gave them his full attention. He let people believe that they, that he would make people feel like they were the most important person to him. To the point that all the Sahaba, numerous Sahabas, all thought they were the most beloved single person in the world. Hmm. Right? Have that type of intelligence. And when we speak out, also, and this is important because in our culture we don't really do this, especially as men. Imam Ghazali mentions praise your brother and say what is good about him. Don't, you know, you don't want to do it in a wrong way. We're going to blow up his ego too much. But when you see something good in your brother and something you love about him, tell him. Because I've been to funerals, man, and after brothers and sisters pass away and we can't tell them anymore. And people have all these praises for a brother, right? But when he was alive, it was always problem. When it was alive, he was a problem child. When he was alive, oh, he, you know, he cool. He got one foot in the street, one foot out. He's like this, you know. But if people would see good things in that person, but not say it. And if they said it, they wouldn't say it in his presence. Especially because as men, we don't, you know, not all some of us don't like to do that. Say it to him while he's alive, man. Maybe you emphasizing that good thing about him will. You know, that encourages him to do more of that. A lot of our young people are lost to despair, man, because they don't see the value or the positivity in themselves. And so you need to tell somebody while they're alive, man, speak out and, and, and praise them where, you know, in a, in a suitable way, where it's suitable and where it's deserved, you know? Mm -hmm. Don't wait until they pass away. And we'll wrap this up. The fifth is forgiveness. We don't cut off people. Uh, you know, if you have a grudge against somebody, a Muslim should try to solve that within three days, according to the Sunnah of the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Excuse me. Not too many papers. The sixth is prayer. Actively pray for each other, man. One of the main things Amir Mustafa does to draw this Jamaat together that I've seen with my own eyes be effective in telling us to pray for each other, to do zikr, and ask Allah to give the benefit uh, you know, to our brothers and so on. Constantly pray for the Jamaat, constantly pray for the Ummah of Muhammad. 
there was somebody who went to one of the teachers, and I'll wrap up very soon, and he asked them, it's one of the teachers in my urinal, I believe, he said, oh, I want like a really powerful, I don't remember exactly what he said, but he had like a whole kind of spiel, like I want this special, powerful, ultra, super Sufi dua, give me some like, some heavy, some like, some anti-aircraft missile of a dua or a dhikr to do, just like give me the big, like give me the big weird shake, you know what I mean, like just, just put, put it on thick in his request. And uh, one of the teachers said, uh, basically make du'a or, or do this certain du'a for mercy on the Ummah of Muhammad so like And do it, you know, with this. And that was the weird he gave. You know, do the basics. The Shaykh says that the uh, arrival is prohibited by loss of the foundation. The basic things. So pray for your brothers in life and after they die. Stay loyal in life and after we die. And that includes looking out for your brother's family and loved ones. Say you should look out for his family, you know, up to 40 years after he passes away. Uh, and informality and not overburdening is the eighth. That's where you can get to a point where you're not at, not only do you not ask too much from your brother, don't ask him for things he can't do, but it's reaching a point where you can be laid back and have good manners, but also not be uptight, not be strict and rigid all the time and formal. And I'll end up this the best of you is the one who is best to his family. And I swear by Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu would not have said that without purpose. And he didn't say that lightly. And he didn't say that just so that you could bring it up as a platitude when women are getting abused in the community and children are getting abused in the community and you have to stand up all of a sudden and say something about how this religion values them. Now that they all have PTSD and all types of other problems. And now you want to stand up and have a khutbah about it. The Prophet didn't say that for you to have a PR line. He said that for us to be good to them. So be good to them, be gentle with them, because that's our future. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi akhirati hasanatan wa qina adab al nar. Our Lord, give us the good in this world and in the hereafter, and protect us from the torment of the fire. Ya Allah, we seek refuge from you from anxiety and grief, from inability and laziness, from stinginess and cowardice and for being overcome by debt and the oppression of men. Ya Allah, send blessings upon our Sayyid, our Sayyid Muhammad, your servant, prophet, and messenger, the unlettered prophet, and upon his family, companions, wives, descendants, and the people of his house. And also have mercy on all of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu And especially have mercy on the Jamaah of the Shaykh Uthman of Bodio, give us spiritual, outward, and inward openings this year, Ya Allah, and protect us. And O oh Allah, have mercy on all the Muslims of the world, and especially right now on the people of Philistine, what they're going through, ease their burden, and retaliate on their enemies, and uh, and then just have mercy on the people of Philistine for what they're going through right now, and all of the Ummah of Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, increase us in brotherhood and in good and everything that was mentioned. I mean, wa